Welcome everyone to this ArchivesSpace Basics training. I'm Jessica Crouch, the Community Engagement Coordinator for ArchivesSpace, and I'm joined today by Corey Schmidt from University of Georgia. In advance of this training, you received an email with an agenda for the training and links to all of the materials you will need to participate in this workshop and to continue learning after the training is over. I also dropped a link directly into the chat just now to that same Google Drive if you're not able to access that email. You will find at the end of your agenda uh, some frequently used resources and directly within that link you will also find the workbook and another copy of your agenda. Um, we may not stick exactly to the agenda, but we will take the plan break at the appropriate time. Um, let's see, what else do I want to cover? We are using Zoom. We are using Zoom webinar for this training and your microphone and camera are both muted. If you'd like to ask questions of the trainer, we ask that you use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you have a general question or need some other form of assistance, please feel free to reach out in the chat. Some questions will be read and answered during the allocated time for Q&A, but we may also answer some questions directly in the Q&A, so be sure you, even if you're not asking a question, be sure you refer to that because there might be some additional information there for you. We are using the latest version of ArchivesSpace for this training, which is version 3.3.1. If you're using an earlier version of archive space at your organization, keep in mind some of the features you see today may not be available to you at home. We also won't be able to troubleshoot issues with your own implementation of archive space at your organization. If you're having troubles with your implementation, please feel free to email us at archivespacehome at lyricist.org. And finally, please keep in mind there are many participants in this workshop from, from a variety of institutions, experience levels, and time zones. Remember that the Archive Space Code of Conduct applies to all Archive Space events, including this one. Please remember to be considerate and respectful in your interactions with your fellow participants, Corey and myself, in the Q&A and chat. This training is going to provide a basic overview of the Archive Space application, primarily the staff user interface. After that, we're going to explore the three primary record types that you can create in ArchivesSpace, accession records, resource records, and digital object records, which are known collectively as material description records in the application. We look forward to talking to, with you today about the ArchivesSpace application. Before I dive into this demo, I want to mention that all of the examples we are using today are real collections held by ArchivesSpace member organizations. These organizations have made their metadata available to the program for the purposes of education and training and in the interest of creating a more diverse set of example data. We're really grateful for that. And finally, I recognize several names uh, in the, the list of attendees, which is wonderful, but I am going to introduce myself. I'm Jessica Crouch, the Community Engagement Coordinator for ArchivesSpace. I've been with the ArchivesSpace program for almost four years, working with archivists and community members to develop educational opportunities like this, uh, as well as documentation about ArchivesSpace and a variety of other resources. Before this, I worked as an archivist in an academic setting, and a lot of my references and examples are informed by that. So if I say something that doesn't match your process exactly, feel free to ask for clarity. We all know there are many different process, processes and use cases in archives, and that is true in archive space as well. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and move directly into the training. Uh, Corey, I'm going to minimize my chat and my Q&A, so if, if you hear or if you see anything that you want to alert me to, please let me know. All right. Will do. Thanks. All right, so let's get started. Uh, like I said, this training is primarily going to cover uh, working within the ArchivesSpace staff user interface. If you are uh, an archivist working in archive space, that is where you're going to spend most of your time. Uh, we will briefly uh, show what the public user interface looks like, but, but primarily we're going to be talking about the staff user interface. You may occasionally hear us say things like the staff side or the um, SUI. We're, we're talking about the staff user interface. Um, the same way if you hear us refer to the PUI, we're talking about the public user interface, which is the public side where your researchers or patrons will go to access the material if you decide to use the public user interface, which is optional. So first, I'm going to give a functional overview of the ArchivesSpace staff user interface. Um, you should be seeing on your screen the ArchivesSpace staff user interface right now. This, when you log into ArchivesSpace, this is what you come to. Um, it's very generic. Uh, it's, it doesn't have a lot going on, but there actually uh, is quite a bit you can do from, from this landing page. So I'm going to point out four different 
command zones, we call them command zones, uh, within the this landing page where you can um, enact things in the application. So the, the first section, if you look right up at the top right corner, that's the repository and application management section. So here, this is where you can do things that will impact the entire archive space implementation, your archive space implementation. If you're an organization that needs to have multiple repositories within your archive space implementation, meaning um, if you are from a large academic institution and maybe you have multiple special collections repositories on campus and you each need to have your own repository to manage your collections, but you still want to share an archive space instance to make all of your material discoverable in one location, you can have individual repositories within one single archive space instance. If you are a user in one individual repository, very likely your permissions will be set so that you only have access to the one repository that you work in, the one department or library you work in. That means that when you log into ArchivesSpace, you're going to you're going to land right into your repository and you don't need to worry about moving between repositories. However, if you are someone who maybe has to work across multiple repositories or uh, you are an administrator at your institution, you will have the ability here to move between repositories. So uh, we are in the repository I would like to be in for this training, but you can see within this test instance, uh, there are two repositories you can move move between, you would just select which repository and it would take you to the correct one. I'm not going to do that because I am where I want to be. Uh, also within uh, this um, repository application management section, you can um, manage some some permission or manage some settings that impact the entire system, the entire archive space system. So you can manage things like uh, your controlled values lists or your drop down lists, uh, those lists that are editable, you can do that there. Um, you can manage your container and location profiles. We are not going to have time to get into that during this training, but just know that is something you can do if you have the appropriate permissions. Um, you can also manage your repositories. So maybe if your repository's phone number changes or you need to update some information, you can do that there. Um, you can also manage your OAI PMH settings, uh, manage your users. So if you need to manage user permissions, you can do that there. And you can also access system information. Um, all of this, if you can see where my mouse is moving, all of that is dependent on your permission levels within archive space. So if you have the appropriate permissions, you can do all of that. If you do not have permissions to do any of this, well, when you click click system, the only thing that you will have the ability to do is access the archive space help center. Uh, if you are affiliated with an archive space member organization, you have access to the help center as part of your your member benefits. Uh, the help center contains the user manual as well as uh, archive space user tutorial videos and recordings of trainings. So it's a it's a great place to go for resources and to learn more about the application and you can get there very easily through the system drop down. Another way you can access the Help Center is all throughout the application and all throughout this training. You will see these little question marks. These are content, content sensitive help links. Anytime you see that question mark, that means that there is a page in the user manual that relates to whatever section of the application that question mark is there for. So if you're looking at something and you're not quite sure what it is and you see that question mark, you just click that and it will take you right out to the Help Center. You do need to have uh, an account within the Help Center and there are instructions online how to set that up. Just make sure you're logged in and you'll be able to access the Help Center. So just keep that in mind as we're moving throughout. Uh, finally, up at the application management section, uh, there is this drop down. From here, uh, you can set various uh, preference levels. Um, <clears throat> if you're an administrator, you can set global and repository preferences. Global preferences means that that preference uh, applies across the entire archive space implementation. Repository preferences means that if you set that preference level, it impacts the repository only. And then uh, your default repository preferences are your personal repository preferences. So if you want to set a, a, a preference just for how you like to work, you can do that there. You also have the ability to become a user. <coughs> Sorry, I have to call. You also have the ability to become a user uh, only if you have administrative privileges. That's handy if you have a user saying, I'm just not seeing something or I'm struggling with something. You can access their account to see exactly what they have going on. <coughs>
sorry. All right, let's keep going. Uh, and then you can manage your user account from there as well. Uh, the next section from this landing page where you can um, access different permissions is directly under this. You have uh, your gear menu. From here, you can access various different types of user permissions and preference management. Uh, you can manage groups, groups meaning permission groups. So you can set um, a permission group that is, these are, you know, archivists and archivists have this level of a permission. These are interns. Interns have this level of permission. You can manage that there. Excuse me for one moment. I knew I was going to call. All right, sorry. Thank you. Uh, you also can manage user access. So again, specific uh, users and their their permissions, their passwords, that sort of thing. You can also um, manage assessment attributes. Uh, we're not going to have time to get into assessments, but know that you can uh, create assessments. Uh, it's a it's a record type that you can create um, about your materials. You can also manage your top containers, which are you know your boxes or that top level uh, containment of your materials. Again, not gonna have time to really get into that. Um, you can also transfer a repository. That is something you will you will maybe hope you will hopefully never have to do. But if you do, you probably will only have to do that once, but you can transfer a repository to another repository. This is also where you can invoke background jobs. So if you need to export a PDF or something like that, um, it's also where you can um, invoke bulk import templates. This is really handy. And if you've ever been to an archive space training before, and this is all sounding familiar, pay attention to this. This is actually uh, one of the newer features in the application. From the bulk import template section, you can, and I'm gonna go ahead and just click on it. You can actually download all of our import templates directly from the application. So. Um, all of the available import templates for the different record types can be downloaded from right there, which is really handy. And again, that's bulk import templates. Also from the gear menu, you can um, run uh, the out of the box reports that come with archive space. Uh, and you also can create and run uh, custom reports. And we're not, again, not gonna have time to get into that, but just know that that is something that you can do there. It's also where you can invoke any plugins that you have uh, applied to your implementation. The out of the box archive space comes with one plugin and that's the LCNAF import tool, which um, again, not gonna have time to get into that, but it's a way to import subjects and agent records into your archive space implementation. I'm going to go back home. The third section of the, the staff user interface home screen relates to really the, the most important part, uh, creating your, your records and finding your records. So from the left side, you can create and browse different record types. Create means you want to create a new record. These are the various record types you can create. And browse means you can browse those record types. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, as you're looking at the create drop down, you're probably noticing or hopefully noticing there's that little line there under the, the top three record types. Um, and those three record types above the line, that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about creating a session records, resource records, and digital object records. These are, um, like I mentioned, they're called your material description records. These are the records that describe your collections. They describe your session records, you know, describing whenever you take custody of material, resource records, probably um, you're more commonly referred to something like a finding aid, but this is where you'd really describe your collection and build out the hierarchy as necessary. And then digital object records. So um, managing um, your digital object metadata and linking out to wherever you store those digital objects. <clears throat> And all three of these record types can be linked back to one another. So anything related, um, so related accession records to resource records and things like that. Under the line, all of the, the other record types you see there, these are records that are intended to enhance your material description records. So under the line, we have subjects and agents. Uh, subjects, exactly that, subject headings that can link your collections together. I'm sorry, give me one more minute. All 
All right, I'm back. We're going to get through this. All right. Uh, so your subject records, those are subject headings that you can use to link your collections together. So you'd only need one subject heading um, to tie all of your related collections together. The same is true with agents. Um, Agents are those people, families, and corporate bodies that um, relate to materials. They might be the subject of the materials, and they might be the donor of the materials, but, but agents represent those people, family, and corporate bodies. Um, you can also create container profiles. We're not going to really have time to get into container management, but, but that's another record you can create. You can also create locations. Uh, you can create either a single location. So, you know, you have a box that you are finished processing and it needs to go on a shelf. Uh, you could create a single location for that one single shelf, or you could create locations in batch. So if you know um, sort of the ranges of your shelves and your, your, your rows, you might want to go ahead and create those locations in batch so that you have this whole list of locations available to you so that whenever you have a box that is ready to go, you have a location in archive space that you can tie it to right away. Um, you can use the locations management and uh, container management to, to use a space calculator as well to help you see what available space is there for you if you are starting to run out of space at your organization, which I think everyone is. Um, you can also create event records. So uh, anytime um, an action is taken on a collection, you can have an event record for when it's processed or maybe um, when it goes out for conservation, that sort of thing. You can create an event record related to your materials. Um, you can also create classification records. This is a great way to group um, related materials together that maybe aren't um, don't really lend themselves to shared subject headings. Uh, a good example of this is um, if you maybe are a college archivist and you would like to have a classification for all of the records that relate to the office of the president and then maybe a classification for the office of the provost, you can group things together like that. There are some really creative ways that users are, are making use of classifications and we recently had a webinar on that as well. So um, if you're interested in classifications, be sure you check out some resources on our YouTube channel. And then finally, as I mentioned, you can run as, uh, assessments of your material. So if you're trying to determine uh, conservation needs for your material uh, or that sort of thing, uh, you can create an assessment that reviews your material. And again, we're not going to have time to get into assessments, but we have done um, specific trainings that relate to assessments. And um, there is one available on YouTube. I think it's about two hours about how, about creating assessments in archive space. And then finally, uh, the, uh, just like you can at the gear menu, you can, you can also invoke background jobs from this section. So if you want to run a background job, um, like creating a report or generating a PDF, you can do that from here. And then um, you can also browse uh, your, your records only after you've created them. But you notice it's essentially the same list uh, of materials. But if you need to browse for collections, you would you would do that here. I'm going to show uh, just how you could browse um, very briefly before moving into searching. Um, so if you just need to browse, you know the specific record type you're interested in, but um, not the specific record, you can always browse. So if you select um, browse resources, give it a minute. All right, so by browsing, it's pulling up all of the resource records in this specific repository. Keep in mind when you're browsing and searching within the staff user interface, you are searching only within the repository you are currently logged in to use. So if you only have access to one repository, you're only going to see uh, the, the resource records available to you there. If, you're, if you have access to all of the repositories, you're still only going to see the resource records for the repository you're in at the time. Um, that is not true on the public user interface. In the public user interface, you're able to search across all repositories at one time. Um, the only time you are searching for records and you may see results from other uh, repositories on the staff user side is for shared record types like subject and agent headings. So here I'm seeing all of the resources available within this single repository. Um, you notice on the left hand side, you're able to filter these browse results several different ways. Um, if you want, you can select show components. I'm going to select it and let's see how long it takes. But um, by selecting show components, you're not just seeing the resource records or the top level record. You're going to see all of the component records or child records associated with that. So you see I went from 12 to almost 5,000 records. 
probably don't want to do that. It probably doesn't help you with your search, but you, you can do that if you'd like. You can also filter by text. Um, if you're remembering that you're interested in a diary, you can do that. Oh. And then there is the, the hopefully, that's the, the result that you wanted. We can clear that. And it will move very slowly. We'll just go back. <laughs> it, in theory, it should work faster, but uh, it's moving a little slow tonight. Uh, you can also um, browse by subject heading here. So if you're looking for a specific subject heading, maybe you have a class coming in, you can do that. You can also see maybe you want to double check that a record is published. Published meaning it goes to the PUI so, the, so your users can find it. You can search that. If you're looking for a specific series or level, you can do that. And, and language and, and record type. So you're able to really drill down and find the specific records you need. But keep in mind, you're only searching or only browsing one specific record type. This is not going to give you results for resources and digital objects. If you're hoping to find um, results across several record types, then you're going to want to use the search function. Um, it's a very, very like Google style search if you use the basic keyword search here. We'll do that again. See, now you're seeing that we have um, two different record types showing up with the word diary in it. One is the resource record we saw and one is a top container. So you can do just a basic uh, keyword search like that. Let's go back home. Or you can do a more complex search. You can do that by tying together multiple fields using the booleans and or or not you can search uh, and you can find those operators here and or or not you can search by um, whatever field you would like to search by so if you don't want to do a keyword search you're looking for a specific subject you could do that and then you can also search um, within particular date ranges if you realize after you've built your complex search you don't want to do that search like i've decided just now you can just hit the delete button to remove them so that is um, sort of the ways to invoke the primary functionality from within the staff user interface. Uh, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and move over very briefly to show what the public user interface looks like. So um, to access the public user interface, um, you can just go down to view public user interface and it will move you right over to your public user interface. Same is true uh, if you're in the public user interface and you want to be on the staff side, you can just click this right down here. <clears throat> now, what we're looking at right now is a very, very basic out of the box um, archive space public user interface. Using the public user interface is optional. Um, there are many different ways that people make their materials discoverable to online users. Um, some repositories may just choose to export metadata output outputs into other systems or use another front end. Um, and we may talk a little bit about export options in just a minute. But if you'd like, you, you can also use the archive space public user interface. Most of what you're seeing here is customizable. So obviously you're gonna wanna replace the archive space logo with your own logo. Uh, you're, you're gonna wanna change um, archive space public interface maybe to something more, um, something that references your own organization. Uh, you can change the colors so that the colors more um, appropriately match um, your organization's colors. You also can change the, the types of records that are available for browsing. So up here, you see all of the different record types that a, a user could browse. They can browse by repository. So within this archive space implementation, we have two different repositories. A user could select just one repository and see all of the materials within that repository and, and browse that way. They can also just browse, uh, you know, all of the, co the collections available. Um, Within the staff user interface, they're called resource records. In the public user interface, they're called collections. You, that is, that's customizable. If you wanted to call them something else, you could. Uh, digital materials, they could browse the digital materials available. They can browse unprocessed materials. Those are accession records. I know that many organizations choose not to publish their accession records for a variety of reasons. 
uh, you could take any one of these away if you'd like, just wouldn't, it wouldn't even be available. So if you wanted to remove unprocessed materials, you could do that. Um, you can also browse by names, which are agents and subjects, and also record groups. Record groups are those classifications that I mentioned earlier. So uh, it's possible for a user to browse <clears throat> all of the different record types in archive space. Well, not all of the different record types, those different record types. Um, they are not able to browse or locate locations, for example, in the public user interface um, for many reasons. Uh, a user could also do a search very similarly to the staff user interface search. They could do a basic keyword search or build out a more complex search if they would like. Um, they can also just hit search, the little magnifying glass to be taken back to the search at any time. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, from the public user side, searching searches across all repositories. So the results that you get will be for every repository in your implementation, not just your, your one repository that you are working in. Um, very briefly, I'm just going to show what a collection looks like from the public user interface. So this is what a published collection would look like to a researcher. Um, you notice that they, they have a variety of different ways to dive into this material. Through the collection or within the collection overview tab, they're able to um, look at the various notes that you have created, particularly your scope and content note, um, dates, those sorts of required um, required fields uh, it, in addition to any biographical or historical notes that have been included. Uh, and then other other fields are included in an accordion, which you can expand or collapse all. Uh, from within the accordion, they can there are other records as well as related subjects that can be found there and some finding aid data. Uh, to the right, they have the ability to sort of move within the the hierarchy. And if they are looking through this collection organization tab and see a particular item that is interesting to them, they can click that and move directly into that record. <clears throat> and you see that Archive Space provides breadcrumbs to help researchers uh, see that they're looking at a, a specific file, but that file relates back to a series and then um, a, a, a resource or a finding aid and then back to this particular repository. So those breadcrumbs are very helpful. Uh, users can also, um, if you have a citation, Archive Space creates a, an out-of-the-box citation, or you can provide your own citation. <clears throat> Archive Space also makes it possible to request material. Um, this is just a functionality that allows your researcher to send an email to whoever you designate to receive the email asking for access to this information. It's not a circulation system, and it doesn't keep track of that sort of thing. It's just going to send an email to someone that you can then reach out to them to arrange for their visit. And there's this staff only button here with a pencil. If you are logged into the staff side, that will be available to you. So if you are looking and researching and you see like, oh, there's a there's an error here. I need to correct this. If you select staff only, it will take you right back to the staff user interface and take you directly into the record where you selected staff side. So it's a good way if you're moving around and you see something that you want to work on in the staff side, you can just very easily transition back over to the public user or to the staff user interface. And uh, just like with the public user interface, as you are working, if you find yourself in the staff side a little bit lost, just always look at your breadcrumbs. Um, it's going to let you know whether or not you are viewing a record or editing a record. We currently have an edited re a record open to edit. It's going to tell you the collection that it's a part of, and then it's going to tell you the record type you're working in. So you're working in resource records. So I know that this is uh, related to this resource record, and it's an archival object record. And we'll, we'll talk about this a little more after the break. And you can always click the, the, the breadcrumbs to get you back to where you want to go. If you want to go back and just view all of the resources, you can do that. Or if you need to go home, you can just click home. Um, with that, let me quickly check the agenda.
Perfect. All right. We do have a little bit of time, which is exactly what I wanted. Um, I want to just give a moment because I know for some people in attendance, this is your first time um, seeing Archive Space or maybe interacting with Archive Space. So if you have questions now before we dive into creating records, let's go ahead and take a moment to, to answer any questions before we do that. So if you have a question about Archive Space or using Archive Space or anything I just showed, please feel free to go ahead and drop that into the Q&A now. And I'll give a few minutes and I'll also check the chat. So if you have any questions, please do drop them in the Q&A now. I don't want to leave anyone behind when we start moving into creating records. And I'll give it just a minute. All right, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. If anyone is is writing a question and they want us to pause, if you could please raise your hand and, and we'll pause. Okay. Well, we will continue on. I'm gonna go ahead and close the chat. So Corey, let me know if anyone says anything. We're gonna go ahead and move on. Um, to talking about a session records in archive space. So let's go ahead and create an accession record. So to do that, you go to create a session record. And it will open up a new template to create an accession record. Another way to create an accession record is um, if you're ever browsing a record type and the record you're looking for is not there, that might mean that it needs to be created. So from browse, you can always create as well. So I'm going to go ahead and hit create a session. So this is a, a new accession uh, record. And I know it, it's many, many fields and it, it might seem a bit overwhelming, but we're going we're gonna to work through this. Um, a session records store information about the receipt of materials, which are typically unprocessed. You can have an accession record for a single item. So maybe you just get in a single scrapbook and you create an accession record. Or it could be an aggregation of materials, which we're all familiar with getting, you know, several boxes of materials. It can represent the acquisition of a new collection and, and which will then result in a new resource record or it could be an accrual for an existing resource. So if you already have a collection that has been processed, you already have an accession record related to that material, you already have a resource record related to that material, but some more stuff comes in that, that which always happens, um, you can create a new, a new accession record for that material. Um, accession records require very little, um, by way of required information. That's because accession records don't have descriptive uh, standards in the United States in the same way that uh, a resource record does. That is changing. There is a, a group working on that. But for now, to save an accession record, all you need to do is you need to have uh, an identifier and, and, a, and, a, and that's it. <laughs> so um, to create a viable accession record, you just need to have your identifier for your accession record. I'm going to make one up really quickly. Uh, you notice that um, as I put information into each box, a new box became available to me. You do not have to use all four of these boxes. You do not have to use um, any sort of set format or standard. You could put that information in the same single box, and that would be fine as well. Um, Archive space is kind of agnostic about that, but just make sure that you are um, being standard in the way that you apply that across the board. Uh, Archive space does require unique identifiers for each individual accession record, same with resource records. Um, it, however, Archive space does not require um, unique identifiers for accession and resource records. I know that some Organizations use the same identifiers for their accessions and resource records uh, because of the many to many relationship of records in archive space, meaning, you know, records can be linked to many different other types of records in archive space. It might be easier to use different um, identifiers for different record types, but it, it would be up to you at your organization. 
You'll notice as we're using the application uh, that if, it, if anything is required, you will see a red asterisk. That means that that information is required to save. So I've provided it with that required information. Let's hit save. And if you have created or supplied it with all the required information, your record will save and you should get a green box that tells you your record was created. If I had not supplied it with all the required information, the box would have been red and it would have told me what I needed to supply it with. So that it gives you that helpful information. Obviously, you're going to want to include more information than this to, to have a complete uh, session record, but that is all that is required to create a session record. Um, <clears throat> you're very likely going to want to include a title or a date at the very least, but again, that would be up to you. Um, there are many, many other uh, fields of basic information you can include uh, to help walk through that instead of building out in a session record in real time. I'm going to go ahead and open up an accession record that already exists within this application. So this is a completed accession record uh, for the Krispy Kreme corporate records, which are held by the Smithsonian. Uh, you can see that they supplied an identifier. And then they also included a, a good bit more information. They provided a title. They provided an accession date. Um, they did not select publish. So if you were... Um, an organization that did want to make your session records viewable to the public, you would want to hit the publish checkboxes that you see throughout the application. That's true for all record types. Um, if you for that's true for resource digital object and a session records. If you want to publish them to the public user interface, you need to select publish either by hitting the publish checkboxes that you'll see all throughout the application or um, once you save a record, you have the or save a resource record, you have the opportunity to publish all, which is a great way to make sure you didn't miss anything. But you would only want to do that if you truly did mean to publish all. If you had a, a collection where maybe you wanted to publish most, but you had a series you didn't want to publish for whatever reason, you would not want to select publish all. Um, so keep in mind that for material to show up in the public user interface, it's kind of opt-in. You have to you have to select publish, and then it will become available. Um, some other basic information you may want to include in a session record includes the content description and the the condition description. In just a moment, I'm going to talk about spawning a, a resource record from an accession record. Um, spawning is a great way to save yourself some time. Um, and by doing by selecting spawning, and again, I'll, I'll talk about it in just a minute. Some of the material, some of the information you've already supplied in your session record will move directly over into uh, an unsaved resource record for you to complete and then save. The content description note here within an accession record that will spawn over or move over as your scope and contents note. So keep in mind. As you're putting information here, you can repurpose that as the beginnings of a scope and content note later. Uh, the condition description, that is um, also going to move over, and that is going to be your physical description note. So again, as you're supplying information there, that will move over to your resource record. Uh, the other fields within the basic information, they do not move over. So keep that in mind as you're creating a session records. And really, as you're creating any record in archive space, make sure you are put, including the information in the fields that you need to include. But if, if it isn't necessary, um, it, it, it is not required that you supply information there. It may not be the best use of your time or your resources to fill out every single se uh, section of an accession record. Um, However, it, it, it may very well be. So, um, for example, the this inventory section, uh, if you have a rough inventory or need to put together a rough inventory in a set or in, for an accession, that's a, a free text field. You can do that. You could put a list there or just a, a descriptive paragraph. Another option would be maybe if you already had an inventory that came with the collection, um, you could just say see attached PDF, and then there is the ability to add an external document. <clears throat> Here you can see on the left hand navigation bar, external document, uh, you can upload that PDF so that it would be a clickable link there. Um, and you'll see all throughout this training and the application, 
uh, on your left hand side, you do have this basic navigation. You can scroll through this whole record and see all the different fields that you can include. And I'm going to talk about these in just a minute. Um, or if you know when you're creating your resource records, we don't include a lot of this information, but we do always include um, an instance, which you, you, you probably will not, or you might. Um, <clears throat> you can drop down directly to that sub record. So you see I clicked instances and it took me, took me right there. And I can hit basic information and it will move me right back up. So you can navigate around the record by using the, these clickable links to the left or just by scrolling. Also, you'll notice as I'm moving throughout the application, whenever <clears throat> I'm holding or, or stopping over a label for a field, you're getting these little um, little helpful notes. So these are um, included within the archive um, the archive space application. These are as soon as you download it, you're going to get these rollover tool tips. The tool tips are um, they're associated with almost all of the labels in archive space. So you just hover your mouse over a particular heading or label to see that rollover text. Um, typically, the text is going to include a definition of whatever the element is. It's also going to reference the appropriate rule in DAX. DAX is describing archives a content standard. That's the American content standard for archives. Um, if you're in an organization that does not use DAX, that maybe uses a different descriptive standard, these rollover tooltips are customizable. So if you want to reference a different standard, you can definitely do that. Um, they'll also reference any export formats such as MARC uh, and some examples of good practice, but they can be completely modified. So if for whatever reason you have a, a specific uh, internal practice or internal use case for a field, you can change these these tool tips to reflect that. So uh, these again, these are completely customizable, but they are very helpful in helping you determine uh, what a particular field is and what deciding whether or not you need to use it. Uh, this basic information section, these fields are specific to a session record. So as we're looking at other record types in archive space, you're not going to see um, this these specific basic this specific basic information uh, in the other record types. However, <clears throat> you will start to see other sub records that seem very familiar. Um, some of which will be required depending on the type of record you're creating. Again, to save in a session record, all you need to supply is uh, an ID. However, there are several sub record types within archive space that once you open them, they become required. For example, language is not required. However, as soon as I selected add language, it opened up the add language subnote and that and and that made language required. So you see now suddenly I have a red asterisk there, meaning that I need to provide it with a language. in order to save the record, or if, oops, I did not mean to open that up, you can use the X here and confirm removal, and then you don't need to supply anything. You've taken away that subnote. Within this accession record, you see that um, dates have been applied, and you see that when you open up a date sub record within archive space, um, multiple things become required. In addition to those red asterisks, which mean that, that you need to provide that information to save the record, <clears throat> you also notice there are some gray asterisks here. When you see a gray asterisk within archive space, that means that that field is conditionally required. That means in order to save the record, you need to provide information either within that field or within another field. Um, and you can select which field is more appropriate depending on your needs. Within the date record, uh, what is conditionally required is you either provide a date expression which they have here, 1930 to 2005, or you include uh, machine readable begin and end dates. For this record, they have supplied both. Uh, that might be a practice you want to do um, or not. You're required to only include one. Date expressions, of course, are more human readable. We know how to read that. Uh, the uh, machine readable begin and end dates are great for if you need to perform uh, 
searches uh, across specific date fields like I showed earlier if you're going if someone is looking for a record that falls within specific dates when you perform that date search it's going to be looking for dates within the this begin and end date so it's something to keep in mind exactly how you want to use that information which is probably why they decided to use both dates They've also supplied an extent for this accession. Again, it is not required for accessions, um, but once that is opened up, all of the required fields are, are highlighted in red. Uh, to include an extent, you can uh, designate whether it's the whole of the collection or the part of the collection. Here, they're saying the whole collection is 18 cubic feet. Uh, you can designate or change um, this uh, type to whatever is appropriate. Um, maybe it's actually um, 18 linear feet. They were mistaken. This list is one of the customizable drop down lists. And you'll often see, as you're seeing here, some things get repeated um, or words get capitalized and then it comes in uncapitalized. And it's, it look, it's, they can get a bit messy as it has here because we've ex imported so much data from so many different institutions. It is possible if you're importing data and you realize, oh no, I misspelled the word folder, which happens all the time. Uh, it is possible to correct that uh, from within from within your preferences and or from within your um, your uh, <laughs> application management up at the top, right up here. Sorry, I'm scrolling so fast. You can manage your controlled values list there, so you can merge control value lists and manage them in that way. All right, fast scroll again. Um, another thing about these subgroups within a record type, you can include multiple extents. You can include multiple dates. For many different reasons, you may need to do that. So here, let's say we have a, a whole 18 linear feet in the collection, but I also want to, I want to make sure it's included that there is a part of the collection that is, let's say 10 cassettes. So if you want to indicate that there is a part of the collection that um, is not represented in the linear feet or you want to highlight that there is this material here, you can do that. One thing you may want to consider when um, doing an accession is if you if you do have something like cassettes or VHS or moving images uh, that maybe will be removed from the collection and, and and sent to another department or that sort of thing. You can always include that in a disposition note. So if you get an accession in that ends up getting divided up or sent to different locations, you can always indicate that with a, a disposition note. Scrolling back down. You also have the ability to link agent records and subject records. Oh gosh, where did this happen? Um, for an accession record, uh, just like with resource and digital object records. Uh, the, the biggest point I want to make about linking agent records in this training, since we're not going to have time to get into how to create agent records, is that no matter the relationship to the material, a person, a family, or a corporate body is always an agent in archive space. So even if Let's say that this Vernon Carver Rudolph, who is a, it's a linked uh, agent record here. Uh, it, they hold the role of creator of this collection, but let's say they're actually the subject of the collection, even though we know Krispy Kreme is the subject of the collection. You would designate their role as subject and save them as an agent with the role of subject. You would never create a person as a subject and link them. They would always be an, an agent who would then hold a specific role, agent subject being one of those. I just want to point that out because I have I've had to do that cleanup project myself. And I know many organizations have had to go in and clean up agent records that have been created as subjects. And it's not a fun process. So I just wanted to point that out. It's also possible to um, Add subject headings, as I mentioned. Um, obviously, this is not an art exhibition, but you can do a keyword search if you know the subject already exists and, and link it there. Or if a subject doesn't exist in your thesaurus, you can always 
create a new subject from right in the accession record or whatever record that you're working in. That's true for agents as well, um, and as well as your instances and resources. Or no, you can't create a resource. You can only browse resources. Um, and then you can see here, there's also a related resource uh, linked. So this means that if you're looking in archive space, you already can tell just by looking at this record that the resource record for this session already exists. In a, in, a, in a workflow, in a perfect environment, which the perfect environment does not exist, but in the perfect environment, you would get a new collection in, you would create a you would create an accession record, and then you would process the collection and create a resource record. So by looking at this, we can assume that that process probably happened in close to the correct order. And there is a resource record already tied to this accession record. Um, any of these dark blue highlighted records, so these agents that we're looking at, these subjects that we're looking at, and now this resource record, when they're that like highlighted dark blue, that means that they are another record type that is linked to whatever record you are in. And if you click on them, you can view that other record. So from here, you can hit view and a new window will open up and it will take you to the resource record of the Krispy Kreme Corporation records. I don't want to dive too much into this record because we haven't gotten to resource records yet, but just know that anytime you see one of these dark blue highlights uh, of a linked record, you can go directly to the record from there. The same is true for um, things like your instances, so your boxes and that sort of thing. So I'm going to go ahead and save our changes to our record. And if I made any mistakes or left anything open, it will tell me. But I did not. All right, so we're good to go. As I mentioned, there are many, many fields in an accession record that you could use. Um, <clears throat> if you are interested in learning more about which fields in an accession record spawn over to a resource record, that information is provided in the Help Center in the user manual. Um, there's a chart that tells you which fields map to which. So that might help you in determining what information you want to include in a session record if you intend to, to spawn resource records from those accession records. Otherwise, um, you know, use your best judgment about the, the level to which you want to describe that accession and your own internal best practice rules. Um, the final thing I am going to show how to do for an accession record is spawn an accession record. I mentioned it several times, so let's do it. Um, so from an accession record, you can spawn a new record. You can spawn three record types from an accession record. Um, you can spawn another accession. So if you have, uh, in the example we used earlier, if you have a collection where you very regularly are getting new material in, you can just find an old accession record and spawn a new accession record, and it will provide you with, um, an unsaved new record and it will bring over some of the information so you're not having to supply the same uh, uh, notes and things over and over again if it happens to be repetitive in that way. Um, you can also spawn a resource record that's what I'm going to do in just a second um, and then you can also spawn an archival object record. This is new functionality with 3.3.1. So if you are using an older version, this is definitely not going to be available to you. Uh, but within this functionality, you can spawn an archival object. So that's a child record of a resource record and, um, and move it directly into an existing resource record. So if you already have a collection, so for example, like the Krispy Kreme corporate records, you already have a completed resource record, but you happen to get three new boxes in that need to be processed and they're going to be a new series, you can create an archival object or spawn an archival object from this accession record and then move it directly into the resource record that already exists as a child record where it, it should fall appropriately. So you can spawn a new series or spawn a new item and, and move it directly into the resource record that already exists where you'd like for it to go. Um, 
but probably uh, the first few times you spawn, you probably are going to be spawning a resource record from an accession record. So to do any of this, you simply go up to the top of your record. Uh, from there, there are, there are a few different actions that you can invoke on your accession record. Um, and, and these will only become available to you after you've saved the record. You need to have a saved record here to do any of this. You can delete the record. You can suppress the record if um, for whatever reason you only want certain people to be able to have access to the record. It also will make sure the record isn't published. So you can suppress a record. Uh, you can add an event to the record. So maybe it's about to get processed. You can add a processing event. You can transfer the record. So if you are a person who has access to multiple repositories and you accidentally created it in the wrong repository, you can transfer it to the appropriate repository. Or you can spawn. So you hit spawn and it gives you that option of, well, what, what sort of new record would you like to create? You select the record type and hit resource here. And you see now I, it has opened up a new resource that has been spawned from the accession Krispy Kreme corporate records. Um, it notes there, this is an unsaved record. It it does not include all of the required information to save a resource record. You can see just by looking at the screen, there, there, are, there are more uh, red asterisks than there were for the accession record. So this is information that must be supplied in order to save the record. So do not assume that by hitting spawn, you have created and saved a new record. Um, this only opens up and starts a template for you. If you open this up and now it's time to go to lunch and you walk away and your archive space implementation times out, you it's not going to automatically save for you. So just keep that in mind. Uh, but this is what a spawned record will look like. This is a resource record, so I'm not going to dive into it too much because I wanted I'm gonna, Corey's going to handle that a little bit later. But I just wanted to to point out that um, it it doesn't bring over the identifier because, like I said, you can use the same identifier if you'd like. But um, Archive Space is going to ask you to supply a unique identifier. Uh, it does if you have included a title. It's going to include that title. It is going to bring over your dates. It's going to bring over your extents. Um, obviously, it's not going to bring over any finding aid data because you haven't supplied that yet. It is going to automatically create a linkage uh, between the the new record and the record you have spawned it from. So you automatically have a related accession record here because of the accession record we spawned it from. Um, and, and your accession record will now have a, a linked resource record tied to it. It brings over your, your uh, agents and subjects. So keep in mind, especially if your accession record ultimately um, does end up the disposition of that record does end up or collection does end up being some material goes in different departments you may need to clean up your subjects and agents a little there and you see here that the that content description and condition description that were supplied in the basic information of the accession record have now ported over as that scope and contents and physical description note um, if you notice that this note it was true with the accession record but now that you've processed it um, it, this has changed. You can go in and rewrite it or delete it. You don't have to, uh, keep the same description that you supplied. You can edit it as necessary, um, or you can remove it. Um, and of course, add more notes, but again, Corey will get into that. Uh, once you have supplied all of the required information, which I have not done, you can hit save. I'm going to hit save just to show you what an incomplete record looks like. So I've done that. So you see, instead of having that happy green color, we now have red, uh, and it's telling me these are the four the the four required fields that I did not supply information, um, and those fields are also highlighted red as well. Uh, you can also click them, and they'll drop you right down to the section that you you need to go and provide that information to. So there, uh, descriptive description. So uh, it will help you if you save a record with some information missing, it will tell you what you need to say. I'm not gonna save this record because I, I don't want to, <laughs> and it already exists uh, in the application, but it is possible to spawn a resource record. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna go back to our home screen.
and I'm going to see if there are any questions about uh, creating a session records. And I'll also, you know, Corey, if there's anything that you feel I missed or you'd like for me to explain in a little more detail, feel free to chime in as well. Sure, yeah. I've been uh, monitoring the Q&A in chat, and so far we haven't had anybody uh, comment. Which, um, but yeah, we'll just kind of keep monitoring it. Sounds good. Um, I'll give we'll give it a couple of minutes. We are a little ahead of schedule, uh, which is perfect. Um, and we have plenty of time for Q&A. So please don't feel shy to ask your question. We're a smaller group, which is wonderful for Q&A. It's nice to have discussions in a smaller group setting. Um, so I will um, talk to myself a little bit for a second and then we'll move to break. Um, I'm, we are getting some uh, messages, some private messages. Please, if you're, if you would like to ask a question, please do use the Q and A feature so that everyone can see and contribute to the questions. It's really helpful if we use the Q and A feature. Um, but uh, someone asked quickly, did you say spawning a record was similar to adding a child? So spawning a record is not the same thing as adding a child. Spawning a record creates a new record type. Uh, depending on what record type you select uh, with some pre-populated fields based on your old record it is not uh, the same thing as adding a child. A child um, is uh, adding a child or a sibling to a record is, is more about creating hierarchy within your resource records and your digital object records. It is possible to spawn an archival object record. So it is possible to spawn a child record and move it into a resource record, but it is, it's not, um, it is not the same functionality as creating a sibling and children relationships within a resource or digital object record. And we'll see that functionality after the break. Any other questions? Uh, Leah says, thank you in the Q&A section. No problem. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and move into our break then. Um, and during the break, if you have a question or something comes to you and you think, oh, I wish I had asked that, please feel free to type into the Q&A while we're at break. And we'll take a couple minutes to answer any questions that may have come in when we come back. Uh, but yeah, we'll go ahead and take a break now. Um, we'll take a 15 minute break. So we will come back um, 22 minutes after the hour. So uh, 15 minutes from now, we will reconvene and continue by talking about resource records. Thanks. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with the second half of this training. Um, during the second half of the training, we're going to cover resource records, uh, both uh, simple, single level resource records and complex resource records. So that parent child relationship that we talked about earlier, building out a hierarchy. And then we're going to talk about creating digital objects in, in our code space. Um, Corey did drop back into the chat the link to the Google Drive that has the agenda for today with all of those helpful links uh, for you to reference after the training, uh, including a workshop evaluation, as well as a link to the workbook. So I, I really encourage everyone to use the Q&A and please feel free to ask us questions. Um, we love to answer questions, so, so please don't be shy and don't hesitate to ask. But if you think of something later, that workbook is there uh, to serve as a as supplement to what we're going over today. We're not following the workbook word for word. There's even more information there than we can go over in three hours. So please do um, download that workbook and keep it somewhere handy because it's a great reference to use later. Um, but 
again, we are here to answer questions uh, for the next hour and a half or so. So please do feel free to ask questions. But uh, Corey, are you ready to, to move on to talking about resource records? Sure thing. Yeah, let me go ahead and uh, start sharing my screen here. Sounds and you can hear me properly. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, that is that is minimally required yeah. uh, for doing Going a great. workshop. <laughs> let me share. Uh, I'm going to go with my browser. Okay, yep. how's right. that looking? That's it. We can see archive space. Cool. Excellent. Um, yeah, so as a brief introduction for myself, uh, I, I noticed I didn't uh, do an introduction. My name is Corey Schmidt. I am the project management librarian slash archivist at the University of Georgia Libraries. Um, I got started working with archive space around uh, three, three and a half years ago. Uh, the University of Georgia hired me as uh, their archive space project manager to manage a migration from archivist toolkit to archive space. Um, and during that process, I learned a lot about archive space, uh, a lot of the, the background, you know, um, the database, the API, and of course the staff user interface and the application itself. Um, I'm not an expert by any means. Um, I'm still relatively new to you know, in archive space years to the application, but I hope that I can um, offer you, offer everyone here some useful information about resources and digital objects. <clears throat> and again, if uh, you have any questions, feel free to pop into the Q and A. Q and A is uh, I'll be I'll be keeping it off to the side here. I've got two monitors set up, and uh, yeah. So without further ado. We'll go ahead and get started. So uh, before I start diving in, excuse me, one moment. Whoa, come on, there we go. Uh, before I start getting diving into just creating a resource record, I just want to back up and and provide uh, a bit of a um, overview of what are we talking about when we talk about resource records. So you know, in archive space, as as Jessica pointed out, um, there are three kind of in my opinion, there are three kind of main pieces of it. There's the accession records that Jessica talked about, resource records and digital objects. And resource records, they're really kind of the heart and soul of archive space. And that's because they are used to describe your collections, right? When we talk about creating finding aids or um, <clears throat> or collection information, what we're really talking about in archive space terms is creating resource records. So um, resources are archival materials, they're intellectual and physical entities, um, and and similar to accessions, resources can be describing one item or a collection of thousands of items. So at the University of Georgia, for instance, uh, we have a bunch of one item collections, and most of those happen to be just like historic maps, for instance, right? We may, a donor or uh, may come in and say, hey, I bought this at an auction and it sold, please give a, you know, <laughs> please take care of it. And so we'll accession it, we'll create a resource record for it, and it'll be just a single item. Um, additionally, though, we also have the uh, Peabody records. So if anybody's familiar with the Peabody Awards, uh, thousands and thousands of, of individual items and um, lots of different series and sub-series and hierarchies to that. And I'll briefly talk a little bit about uh, that hierarchy uh, when we get into multi-level resource records. Um, but yeah, just uh, just as kind of a, an overview, resources, again, they can be single things, multiple things, things with hierarchies, but really at the heart of it, we're talking about our collections. And when we make a resource record, we're making it so that um, our users can use it and, and conduct their research in the best way possible. So um, with that kind of overview of resources, let's just go ahead and dive in. Um, so I'm here at the home screen. Um, as Jessica pointed out, you can spawn a resource from an accession record. I'm not going to show that because she already did. So I'm just going to start with a, a blank template. So I'm going to go to the top right corner here, create resource. And we're going to give it a minute. There we go. Cool. OK. So we are starting with a completely blank template here. Um, 
no information from accession records, nothing like that. It's all just uh, ready to go. So the first bit that I want to point out is um, this first uh, section here, the basic information. Um, when you when you're filling out a resource record, right, there are only three requirements, as, as Jessica pointed out, the three red asterisk, uh, asterisks required fields. Title, pretty simple, right? What What is the title of the collection um, that we're going to create? So I'm just going to put John Doe Papers. Pretty simple, straightforward. Identifier, this works um, pretty much exactly the same as accession records, um, where, you know, this is a free text field, so I can type in MS0001. And, uh, you know, as I continue to fill out things, A, B, C, right, those those fields come into play. Um, one thing to note about the identifier, if you do fill out these boxes, and let's say you uh, export this resource, and I'll talk a bit uh, briefly about that, um, they are exported as dashes. So you'll see it as MS001 dash A dash B dash C. Um, so do keep that in mind if you're going to be playing around with the data. Um, but you can also just do that within the free text field, the first free text field, if you want. Um, that is totally, totally up to you. Uh, the next required field in the basic information is the level of description. So what are we talking about? Are we talking about a class, a collection, a file, an item? For us, we're talking about a collection because it's going to be a series. It's going to be a collection of stuff. Uh, I was about to use the word series there. It's not a series, it's a collection of stuff. Um, the next few fields, again, these are not required, but they are handy, especially for resource records. What is the resource type? Are we talking about collection, papers, publications, records? Again, totally optional, uh, up to you and your descriptive practices. Um, as you can tell from accessions, and as you will tell from resources, there's a lot of optional fields, and it becomes quite overwhelming to fill out every single one. So don't do that to yourself if you don't have to, um, unless your standards are are that high. Um, but for us, you know, we'll just fill out papers because it's fun to fill out papers. Next up is publish. Uh, as Jessica pointed out, publish is really important um, because it makes this record available to researchers via the archive space PUI. Also available um, in any sort of exported uh, records that you might that you might send. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Restrictions apply. Restrictions apply is also pretty useful because um, you may have a collection that was donated by a politician or by um, you know, some some organization where uh, their information needs to be kept from uh, kept from the public, uh, kept from researchers. So if you have anything like that, you might consider checkboxing this. Um, and then as we get later on, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of uh, point out places where you can sort of fill in additional information of where those restrictions might apply. Repository processing note, again, fill it, fill it out if you want to. Uh, next up, are languages. So when we talk about languages, and, and Jess hit on a little bit about this, we're really talking about what is the language of the materials. Um, and I want to make that clear, because there's going to be another required language thing, and it's it's a bit confusing at times. But this particular section that we're looking at, what is the language of the materials that we're describing? So for, for us at the University of Georgia, the vast majority of collections are in English. Um, so I can put English, and if I want to, again, it's completely optional, I can put what is the script of that language, and I believe the script ooh, for English is Latin, and uh, we have it. Um, if you have a collection with multiple languages, you can add multiple languages to that by simply clicking uh, on the top uh the top left hand screen here, add language, and voila, you have another uh, language box that you can include. And I can say uh, Spanish. Um, it, it defaults to colon Castilian, uh, and uh, that's just a default archive space thing. Um, and then you can fill out the script if you want. And if you, if you're like, oh, actually, it doesn't do that, uh, it does, we don't have any Spanish uh, things in our collection, you can just 
click to remove it. You can also add a language note if you want to. Um, you can also add a language note, I believe, in the notes section. So again, it's just kind of the workflow, kind of giving you all the options available as you're here. Next up, we have dates. And uh, Jessica did a really good job describing dates uh, in accession records. And there's, I don't really have much to add, really. I mean, it's basically the same as you would see in an accession record. You have your two required fields, label and type. Label, you can choose from a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, your uh, type, you know, what kind of what kind of data are you talking about? Uh, many times we use inclusive or single dates for single items, for instance. Um, and then you can yeah, put in the dates for machine readable, or you can use an expression, um, and that is conditionally required. So you got to have either of them. You got you to gotta have something. Um, so for us, we're going to say, actually, I'm, I have uh, some, some data right here. I'm going to say between May 1st, 1976 and 1978. And if I wanted to fill out those dates, I could do that. Um, and I can actually type that in, you know, year, year. So let's see, 1976. Uh, da Oops, that's not a dash. Dash 05-01. And it would default to, to that. And then I 1978. Cool. And certainty era calendar, again, completely optional, up to you. Next up, we have extents. And again, uh, Jess kind of covered a little bit of, about this in the accessions portion. And yeah, there's really not much to say. You know, uh, three required fields. What's the portion of the extent? What's the number? And what's the type? Again, extent is talking about the size of the described materials. So how much stuff is on the shelf or in the warehouse or however you are uh, storing it? So for us, we're going to keep it very simple. We're going to say five whole linear feet and we're going to keep it very simple next up is something that is unique to resource records and that is the finding aid data section so this is where you can really sort of get into the nitty-gritty of what information you want displayed um, for your finding aid data um, in this section there are only two required fields and if i scroll down here you can see them language of description script of description I believe this became a requirement in Archive Space 2.7, question mark, I think. Um, so uh, if you're using a version later than that, uh, these fields would definitely be required. If you're using a version earlier than that, it won't be required, um, but just, just FYI. And the language of description, it's really just talking about what language are you using to describe your collection it's kind of it's a bit it's a bit obvious i know but um yeah and again for most of our stuff that we hear that we use here at university of georgia it's going to be written in english um, and the script that we use for english is latin um if for instance you have a collection where uh, it's it's part of a, an indigenous uh indigenous culture and you want to describe it in that in that indigenous language, you may want to uh, you may want to fill out those fields uh, with the appropriate language. Um, I know that uh, some some of our collections we have some collections that are uh, written uh, in in English, but also some that are written in Spanish. So we actually write the finding aid in Spanish to make it more accessible for those users. Um, so again. That's sort of a local practice, entirely up to you whether you want to do that or not. Um, other fields of information that could be more or less useful, uh, EAD ID and EAD location. So EAD, um, for anybody who isn't aware, is, stands for Encoded Archival Description. Um, it is basically a, a way for you to uh, extract all this information out of archive space in, in a standard way so that you could, for instance, uh, use that information and display it on a different kind of website. Um, so for, for, for us, uh, again, at, at the University of Georgia, we don't actually use the archive space PUI. We use our own custom uh, website. And what we do is we take, we, we fill out all of our information in archive space, right? We fill out all the resources uh, information, then we export it as an EAD 
XML file. So it's an encoded archival description. Um, it's an encoded archival description standard um, that is uh, in an XML file. So, you know, using the XML syntax. Um, and then we take that information, we do some fancy stuff with it, and we display it on our own finding aid website for, for our researchers to look up and do all that stuff. So um, again, depending on what you're using it for, that could be entirely useful or useless. <laughs> it just depends on uh, your own practices. Finding a uh, other information, finding a title, subtitle, filing title. Again, fill this stuff if you absolutely need to. Finding an author um, could be useful. For instance, if you have uh, student workers or interns or you know regular processors, and you want to add their signature to it, and be like, hey, you know, I've I've processed this many things in the year, and you can actually see that because I've I've noted my name here. Um, Description rules that can be pretty useful, especially for institutions that are not using DAX. Right, um, one uh, one standard that I, I think is uh, uh, more international in scope is the International Standard for Archival Description (ISAG). So, if you're like, "Hey, we didn't use DAX; we used ISAG, or we used RDA, or something like that," um, you have those options available if you want to specify that. And we see, da, 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 da. Corey. Yes. Can I chime in with one thing about finding aid uh, information, <laughs> the, the finding aid data? Yeah, Just, absolutely. Well, going back to the EAD ID, I want to highlight that while we're looking at it. If you plan to use um, the load via spreadsheet option within Archive Space to import your information as a spreadsheet, um, the EAD ID field is um, one of the fields that you can use to let Archive Space know the information you are importing in relates to this resource record. So just keep in mind if you're using that spreadsheet, that's a question that comes up frequently is, well, it's telling me it needs the EAD ID. You supply that right there. So if um, if you are looking at using the load via spreadsheet functionality, one of the, the template, um, that EAD ID field, that's what it, it is asking for if it is giving you that particular error message. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to get into the import via spreadsheet um, module because this is like a whirlwind of information. Uh, this is a really brief overview of resources, but it is a fantastic tool. Let me tell you guys, it is, um, it's a great way for you to just fill out a collection um, with multiple levels. And it, it it's a lot easier than some of the, we'll call it archaic ways of <laughs> that you can use in archive space. Um, I'll uh, talking about uh, rapid data entry, but uh, yeah, if you are more, if you're curious about load via spreadsheet and you're like, hey, what are you guys talking about? Do check out the Archive Space Help Center if you have access to it, um, and uh, it has a lot of great information on there, and I think we've done tutorials and stuff like that um, that you can check out, um, but anyway, uh, so yeah, back to finding aid stuff. Um, now, as far as resource records go uh, and required fields, that's actually it. That's all you need is, yes, it's considerably more than accessions, but, you know, language description, script description, and all the fields, you know, extent, dates, languages, basic information. Once I have all that information, I can click save up here or over to the left-hand side on the, uh, the, uh, the contents, table of contents. Ah, yeah, we have our first culprit. The identifier is already in use. So I have made a terrible mistake and my identifier is not unique. So I must make it unique. And I'm going to make it unique by adding a dash A because I'm so, I'm clever like that. I know, not exactly. But um, yeah, it's one of those cases where, you know, you do have to make sure that if you are applying some sort of standard to your identifiers, you want to make sure that they are unique um, because archive space will complain and it'll say, hey, you've already got something that says this. So. Okay, now that we have uh, our basic resource information, right? It's um, all of the required top level information. Um, I'm going to briefly go over some additional uh, information uh, that you can add to resource records. Um, again, this is a very, very brief overview of all of this. So if you want a deeper dive, Archive Space Help Center, uh, Brittany Newberry and I did a workshop last year uh, doing a 
uh, two or three hour workshop on just resources. And it was a fantastic deep dive. So do highly recommend you check that out in the Archive Space Help Center if you want uh, some more context and, and how this stuff works. So additional information that you can include um, with resources uh, uh, to uh, sort of enhance the description, um, revision statements that could be useful, for instance, if you know you get a new accession and you now have to update the collection, right? So I'll add a revision statement saying, hey, we revised it and we can add a revision date, revision description, that's just a free text field. Um, and uh, ah, a little publish. I'm good in that. I'll get into that a little, a little bit later. Related accessions. Again, because we did not spawn from a from an accession, uh, we don't actually have anything to link. But if I wanted to link an accession, all I would have to do is click Add Related Accession, and I could search for something, or I could use the drop down box and click Browse, and I could say, yeah, this is related to Krispy Kreme because why not? Um, and I could link it. Next up are agent links. So agent links uh, just did a, a pretty good uh, sort of overview of, of agents. Again, they're they're talking about um, they're talking about uh, persons, corporate entities, and families. Uh, it's it's those sort of three things, right? And so these are partic can be very important because you know, for instance, a lot of the collections that you have. Um, will either be created by somebody, will be sourced by somebody, or they'll mention somebody really famous like Abraham Lincoln. And you're like, I need to make sure that my researchers know that there's some information about Abraham Lincoln in here. Um, so agent links can be very important for you know being able to associate your collection with uh, important people, families, or corporate entities. And you would add this in, Pretty much the same way as accessions, um, you would select uh, your your role. That is one of the required fields. So, you know, who is this person? We're going to say that they are the creator. Um, and oh, come on, no, there we go. Okay, a little buggy there. Sometimes if you get stuck and it's like it's not going away, you'll have to click. You'll have to click it again, and then you'll get a little X, and then it'll go away. The tooltip. Um, Title, what is the title of the person? Uh, relator. Relator is just a big, big, big drop down of many things. <laughs> Again, optional. Do it only if you'd like to. And then you have the other uh, field, which is agents. This is where you search um, in archive space for agent records that have already. Uh, either been imported into your archive space instance um, or created locally. Um, so for instance, uh, Jessica mentioned that one of the default plugins that you get um, in your archive space instance out of the box is the LCNAF plugin, um, which stands for Library of Congress Name Authority Files. And uh, you know, if I wanted to say um, import Abraham Lincoln, yeah, I'm just stick with Abraham Lincoln uh, from the Library of Congress name authority files. I could use that plugin to import that information from that authority file into my archive space instance. And then I could link um, Abraham Lincoln to this specific collection. I don't think we have Abraham Lincoln, unfortunately, um, but that's okay. I can link somebody else. Um, I click browse, I can browse and 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 select a person. Um, but also I could uh, over to the, the right hand side in the drop down box, I could choose to create, I could create a person family corporate entity. Um, I didn't know about the software. I don't think we support software anymore. I'm not sure. Um, Jessica might be able to correct me on that. Um, but for our purposes, we're sticking with person family or corporate entity. And that would take me to a screen where I could fill out information to create a agent for that particular person. Again, because this is a whirlwind tour of resources, we do not have time to cover agents. But if you are curious, we have plenty of resources in the Archive Space Help Center. And if you have a really esoteric question and you're just like, Our Help Center is not helping me. I uh, also want to point out there is the Archive Space User Group Listserv. Um, which, uh, again, a lot of people uh, who use Archive Space, who are members, um, they can 
send out an email and say, hey, does anybody have this particular issue? Or I have a question about agents and a lot of helpful people there to help answer your questions. I definitely took advantage of that when I was starting out. So um, for me, I'm going to, you know what? I'm just going to add somebody. Uh, I'm going to add an actual person and not administrator. And it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like a real person. There we go. Okay. Uh, next up, we have subjects. Uh, subjects, again, kind of work very similarly to, to agents. You just kind of, you know, click and browse. You can search for a particular subject or you can browse or create a subject. Again, I don't really have time to go into what it takes to create a subject. Um, just know that the the plugin that comes with Archive Space, that LCNAF plugin, you can also import Library of Congress uh, subject headings. So if you wanted to import, you know, a subject from from that authority file, you could do that, um, or you could create your own local subject uh, for for this particular collection. Um, it can get really out of hand uh, <laughs> quickly if you have lots and lots of subjects. Um, ask me because we have over five thousand of subjects and it's it's a lot it's a lot of subjects um so again you just uh make sure to consult sort of your local practices uh as far as you know when to add subjects what a subject what subjects to import um what subjects to create locally that kind of stuff um we're not here to really answer that you know how do you, when do you do that um but uh there's certainly you know the archive space user group listserv might be uh might be a way for you to ask some of those questions of hey you know what are, how are people you know defining those sorts of rules uh, next up, and this is really important, I really want to highlight this, are the notes section. Notes uh, are really going to be talking about, you know, we're, we're talking about your, your bread and butter for finding aids, your biographical historical note, your scope and contents note, um, your abstracts, your accruals. There are, I believe, 29 different notes that, that ship in archive space uh, by default. So you've got a lot of notes, a lot of different kinds of notes that you can add. Um, so if I want to add a note, I click add on the on top right corner here. I'm immediately greeted with what kind of note, uh, what note type that I want to select. And so from this drop down, I can select a whole bunch of different notes and they're all great. Um, a couple that I will point out, um, this conditions governing access and use, uh, that could be particularly useful if, for instance, you uh, hit that checkbox at the very top that said restrictions apply, and you could add one of those notes to say, hey, this is the further context as to why these restrictions apply, for instance. Um, another one that I'm going to point out, and I'm actually going to demo this, um, is the general note. So general note, you know, it's like, it's the whatever note of the notes. Um, but uh, you could uh, you could use the general note to create what uh, uh, what some places are calling a harmful language note. Um, so, if, you know, for instance, uh, you want to make sure that, you know, if, if a collection has potentially harmful language and you're like, hey, I want to make a note uh, specifically for that reason, um, you might consider using what I'm about to demo here as an example. So if I wanted to create a harmful language note, I would select general. Um, I wouldn't fill out persistent ID unless you want to do that. But under the label, under the label field, what I would say is I would say harmful, oh, you can tell I practice, uh, harmful language note. And what this label is going to do is in, excuse me, in the archive space PUI, um, the label of the note, like as people see it, they're going to say, oh, hey, that says harmful language note. Um, and in any exports, um, the label of this note is going to be harmful language note. So you can sort of say, hey, it's not just a general note, even though that is the note type. This is the label is, you know, what is describing what the note is. Um, next up, you know, we have type again. So again, it's, it's general. Um, publish. You notice that there are two publishes here. You notice the publish right here. And in the text field, in the subnotes, text, content, and under that is publish. So this is where it gets a bit tricky, and this is where um, I'm really glad Jess men uh, Jessica mentioned uh, this uh, uh, publish all button, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, because when when you are filling out a resource record, you have to make sure to 
publish each component of, for instance, a note, because I could set this note to publish. I could say harmful language note publish, and I could say uh, in the content section, this collection contains harmful language, right? But if I don't hit publish here, if I don't hit publish here, the content, what I just wrote out, will not appear in the PUI, and it won't appear in any exports that I that I use. So, um, so if you want to make sure that everything, everything in the resource is published, you want to make sure to use that uh, publish all button. And I'll get to that, but I'll point it out when we get there. Um, so again, you want to make sure that each each thing is clicked publish so that it is viewable. Um, and as far as, you know, any other notes, um, again, if, if you have other notes that you want to add, you can click add note, or you could click add note on the bottom here, and we can add another note type. And for our sake, I'm going to demo one here, say scope and contents note. Love me some scope and contents notes. They're great. Um, we're going to say 42 letters, plain and simple, publish, publish, cool. Um, a couple th other things to note about notes um, are that you notice that on the left hand side there is a couple of hamburgers so we're going to ignore this hamburger um, but we're going to pay attention to this one if i click and hold this hamburger i get the i get the option to move it around and that moves the order in which these notes appear so if i want wanted the scope and contents note to appear in the pui or in any exports uh, above the harmful language note that I wrote, I could drag and drop that. Additionally, you notice that there's this button here called apply standard note order. This refers to um, if you have in your preferences, uh, uh, you have a set order of which you want to, uh, you want all, uh, all notes to apply, right? You're like, I want scope and, non scope and con contents note first. <laughs> Then I want biographical, historical, then I want harmful language or general. Um, if I click this button, it will automatically sort that in that preference setting. Um, so it can help you set, uh, save a bit of time if you already have that preference set up. Um, if not, you can just drag and drop, move it around however, however you want it displayed. Um, and notes are uh, sequenced vertically, um, displayed in order in which they appear, but I've already said that, so cool. Uh, and then there is a whole bunch of other information here. I will get to, I hope I can get to instances, um, to cover a little bit because that's very important, but all the other fields, um, do make sure to check out the archive space help center for more detailed information about these fields. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, yeah, please feel free to use the Q, uh, Q and A and ask a question of, Hey, actually, could you point out that field that looks weird? Um, yeah, feel free to do that. So I'm going to save the resource and I'm going to cross my fingers that everything works okay. Okay, awesome. Uh, and yeah, so now that I've saved this resource, um, I get a bunch of different options. So I'm going to start, um, I'm actually going to start here in this section. So you noticed uh, when Jessica was pointing out accessions, there were a few options. Well, with resources, you have a few more options. Um, add event. Uh, again, if you sort of want to use events, uh, you can use that feature. But I'm going to now point out publish all and unpublish all. These are the buttons that are really awesome because if I wanted to publish everything all of the sub components all of the you know the notes and the content of those notes i want to make sure that everything in this re this top level resource is published i would click this publish all and it would say hey the this action will publish this record any sub records and all components in the hierarchy i can say publish all and then voila, they are published. I can also do the opposite. I can unpublish all in case, um, in case I'm like, oh no, you can get everything, get everything out, don't display it, uh, that, that sort of thing. Um, and I'll point out uh, another useful utility of that uh, when we start talking about multi-level resources. 
export exports uh, again for for us here at the University of Georgia we actually use EAD XML files so we actually use the export feature a lot um, you have a, a few different options we have download EAD right which is downloading that encoded archival description uh, XML file um, and you have a few options here that you can that you can choose you can download a mark XML container labels container template or generate a PDF and that will start off a background job which will create a PDF for this resource that you can then share to researchers you know or uh, publish on a website or, or however you want to use that uh, merge can be fairly useful if for instance um, you want to merge an existing resource into uh, this resource that that we're currently in um, so you might say uh, you know, I talked about the, the Peabody Awards here at the University of Georgia. We actually split those up by years. So if we were wanting to just merge all of them into one, right? We're just like, okay, instead of 1979, 1979, 1980, 1989, we're just going to merge it all into one ginormous resource record. This is where we could do that. We could just merge all those into one and, uh, and you would yeah, combine all the information in, into one resource record. Transfer, again, this is a case where if you want to transfer this resource uh, to a different repository, you could do that. Um, the more contains a few useful things like calculating extents, dates, or creating an assessment. Use those if you want to. Um, okay, cool. Uh, now I'd like to start talking about multi-level. Um, you'll notice on the top left-hand side, uh, we have a few options here, um, but this is all to deal with multi-level resources, which I uh, will get to now, and, uh, and I'll talk about these a bit more in detail as I'm as I'm going through uh, multi-level resource records. So, uh, excuse me one second. I'm going to take a sip of water. Okay. Whew. All right. So, multi-level resources. Um, what's the what are we talking about when we talk about multi-level resources? Uh, what we're really talking about is a is a hierarchy. It's describing the logical or physical ag aggregation of materials in a hierarchy. So, the too long didn't read version is treat uh, multi-level resource records like a parent child sibling hierarchy where um, there is a parent record that could spawn a child so that child um, would then uh, be beneath the parent but that child could have a sibling so that sibling exists at the same level as that child um, and then that sibling could have another child, and then you could embed it further nested within that hierarchy. So you can keep going down a lot. You can keep, you can keep nesting and nesting and nesting and nesting, adding children, adding children, adding siblings, that kind of thing, and sort of linking all the others right with with that parent child sibling relationship. So again, it's really just about sort of envisioning that. It's a hierarchy. It's kind of it's a hierarchy. It's like a tr it's like a family tree, right? Parent, children, siblings. Chil they have children. They are now parents, and 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 they are those children are are uh, children to their parents. That kind of thing. Um, I'll hopefully <laughs> my demonstration will make a bit more sense of that. Um, so uh, a few things to note before I move on. Um, as far as how many levels down you can go, right? So I said you could go add a child, add child, add child, and, and keep nesting and nesting and nesting. In archive space, you can do that unlimited times. You can create as many nested archival objects, uh, as many nested children as, as, as you can. However, if you want to export an EAD XML file, like what we do, uh, you can only go 12 levels deep. At that point, EAD says, stop it. Don't do that. Um, you can't handle it. So do keep that in mind if you are going to use that feature. Um, you can only go 12 down. But if you're not, go as far down as you would like, or that makes sense. Um, so in order to 
let's let's get into the meat of of what we're talking about or tofu whichever is your preference um so if i wanted to make this resource rev record right now it's existing just kind of as a, as a simple single level resource record right it's just the top level information i wanted to start adding levels i wanted to start adding children i would go up to the top left corner here i would click add a child that will automatically create what Archive space calls an archival object, and an archival object is just a way of describing something that's underneath a resource record. Um, so, a child, basically. And from here, I can start to fill out uh, the information about this particular archival object. So, for me, I am going to say um, in the basic information field, we have a few fields. Uh, title is conditionally required. You don't actually need a title, um, but you either need a title or you need a date. Notice that dates is, uh, is gray, has the gray asterisk, and title has a gray date, so uh, has a gray asterisk. So again, you need either of those. You either need a date or you need a title um, in order for it to save properly. So for us, I'm going to say letter to uh, Mr. Friedman for my uh, title. The ref ID is automatically generated. Don't worry about that. Component unique identifier. This is the case where if you wanted to assign your own unique identifier to this child, this archival object, you could do that. Um, and it's a free text field. Make sure it's unique though, um, or else archive space will be unhappy. Uh, level of description is definitely required. So that's just talking about, well, what is the thing, right? Well, what is the uh, what is the level of this thing? Um, because it's an individual item, I think it's most appropriate in this circumstance to call it an item. I will want to definitely hit publish um, or else this thing will not appear in the archive space py or in any exports um, i can add a language if i want wanted to um, if i didn't add a language and you were like um you know what what is the language of this thing um it would refer to your top level resource information and be like oh yeah it's in english um Dates, again, this is conditionally required. You don't actually have to fill this out if you already have a title, but if you don't have a title, you do have to fill it out. Um, and I could say, I'm going to fill it out because I I want to. Um, label, expression, type, I would say it's a single type, and I could do that for the machines. Um, <laughs> just, to make their, just to make the machine's life a little easier, um, I could fill out that information. And the rest of this, uh, the rest of this information, as you can kind of tell, it looks really similar to resource records, and that's because it, it's basically all the same information um, that you can add uh, in an, in a resource record. Um, the other thing that I'm going to point out are instances. Instances are super important to archive space because they are describing your boxes. They're describing your physical thing. But they can also describe your digital objects, right? You can have a container instance, which talks about, you know, what's the th what's the container that this item is in, um, or you could add a digital object as an instance, which means what is the digitized instance of this particular archival of this particular child of this archival object. Um, so it's. Uh, yeah, so uh, I will just go ahead and click Add Container Instance. So this is the case where I'm automatically greeted with two required fields if I wanted to add a container instance. And again, we're mostly just talking about boxes at this point. Um, the first required field is going to be type. So uh, your type is going to be, you know, what kind of uh, what kind of stuff, right? What what stuff we'll be talking about here? Um, uh, and we have a bunch of different options. Again, this is this drop-down list is modifiable via control value lists. Um, uh, we, when I was doing the archive space migration, one of our things that we had to clean up were the extent types because we had over 200 extent types. That's a long. That's too long. Too long of a list. Don't do that. 
to anybody. Um, so we're going to stick with uh, mixed materials because it's pretty generic and uh, pretty common to use mixed materials as the type. Next, we have top container. You notice that I can actually search this. Uh, I, I can search this and it will, uh, it, well, it won't show up anything if I just type box. Um, but if I, for instance, um, you may have a case where it's like, I already created a box one for this resource. I know that it exists. You could type in, you know, box one or whatever. And it says, oh, hey, yes, you've already created a top container. You've already created a box one for this resource. Let me go ahead and link that for you. Um, that's where you could do that. You could also go to the, the drop down and you could either browse existing top containers um, or you could create one. So, right, this is the first time I'm making this archival object. I could create a new top container that has information about, you know, what kind of top container and and i'll briefly since we have a little extra time i'll actually click create to, to show you this part um so if i click create um this is the case where you know i could say what is the container type well it's a box what is the container indicator what's the number of the box i could say it's box one if i have barcodes which we here at the university of georgia we love our barcodes we would fill out what barcode is that and i think you can actually use the scanner thing and it, it'll automatically uh add that don't quote me on that but it is pretty it's pretty fun um and then you know any other information i can use i could say create and link to and uh, voila, I've, have, I've got my box one, right? I've got my container instance. And from here, if I wanted to get even more granular, I could say, uh, what is the child type? And, and, um, and this is the case where typically we use uh, child type to indicate a folder and the child indicator to indicate what the number of the folder is, right? So I have I have a box one for this collection, and this particular letter, letter is in folder one. And then if I wanted to get really granular, I could say it's uh, the grandchild type is item one. It is the first letter in the first folder in the first box of this collection. I could get really super duper granular with it. So again, this is a super fast um, explanation of instances. Um, so again, please, uh, Consult the Archive Space Help Center for more information about how instances work. Um, I will go over digital objects a little bit later. Um, so now I get the chance to save my archival object, and you'll notice I also have a plus one on the side. What does that plus one do? If I click on the plus one, what will happen is it saves the object, the 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 child that I just made, the letter to Dr. Freeman. It saves that, and it automatically opens up a new uh, a new archival object, one that is a sibling, a sibling to uh, to the one I just filled out. Um, so um, I could say I'm just going to call this letters, um, and let's say you know I actually I don't want to. I don't want this to be an item. I want this to be a series. Um, I could say level of description. I could say call this a series, say publish, and I'm not going to fill anything out. I'm just going to save the archival object. This is where I'm going to briefly get into uh, a really cool feature in archive space called re enable reorder mode. So you'll notice that I have this item existing on the same level as this series. I don't want that. I want this series to be the parent of this item or the other way around all right i want the this letter to Dr. mr friedman to be a child of letters so enable reorder mode uh allows me to rearrange the collection in a way that makes sense um either to how the collection is uh, organized or what makes sense um in our description so you'll you're automatically greeted in this top level context menu um, where we start moving things around, you have to go to the very left-hand corner to these little dots here. And again, if this is too small, please let me know and I can uh, uh, make my screen bigger. Um, as I hover over it, I get the quadruple arrows, which says, hey, you can, uh, I click and hold, and then I move it. And I can, you notice how it, it turns green as I move it uh, over letter to Dr. Freeman. I'm going to release, 
And now I have three options. I can either add uh, that letters as an item before Dr. Freeman. So it wouldn't, so it'd still be at the same level, but it would be before it in that order. I could add it as a child to letter Dr. Freeman, or I could let it, uh, or I could have it as uh, an item after, which if I do that, it wouldn't do anything because it's already after that. Um, but for me, in this particular circumstance, I want this letter to be underneath the, uh, this series. So I'm actually going to click and hold letter to Dr. Freeman, move it above letters. I'm going to say add, child, add items as children. It's going to load and voila, it is now underneath the series. So now we have a proper multi-level hierarchical collection. Um, and all I need to do is disable reorder mode. It'll think about it for a sec. And we're good to go. And that is how uh, we sort of really get into uh, enable reorder, enable <laughs> reordering our collection. Um, uh, a cool little hack uh, that a previous trainer taught me is that uh, if, for instance, let's say you have a bunch of archival objects and and, and it's and it's all underneath, like uh, you have a bunch of things, like you have a bunch of stuff and you're like, I want to delete it all from this collection because either we moved it or we sent it somewhere else, whatever. Um, what I might consider doing is I could move uh, all of those archival objects into a dummy series, and then I could delete that series. And by deleting that series, it would also delete all of the archival objects underneath that series. So if I didn't want to go through each item and go delete, click, delete, click, delete, what I could do is I could use that enable reorder mode to sort of shift things underneath that series, delete that series, and voila, it's it's done. So as you sort of work with archive space, you kind of notice there are a few hacks like that that uh, make the quality of life maybe a bit easier for, for bulk operations. Um, so a, a few of the other options available to you in multi-level resource records. Um, again, enable reorder mode, we already talked about that. Add a child, add a child adds to the same level, right? So if I wanted another series, I could do that. Add it, uh, I'm sorry, add a child. I reversed it in my head. Adding a child to the letters series would add it, uh, add another letter within uh, underneath that series. Adding a sibling would add another thing that exists at the same level as this series. Load via spreadsheet is awesome. I mentioned it a bit. Uh, again, load via spreadsheet. Uh, basically, it's uh, you you take an Excel template or a CSV template, and it's got a bunch of columns of all of this, you know, all of this basic information, all of these fields, and you can fill it out in an Excel, in Excel or in uh, sheets or whatever you use, and you can uh, assign it a hierarchical order, right? And then you can import that into archive space. So instead of filling out one by one each archival object in archive space, you could actually just use a spreadsheet and, and use Excel to help automate it. Or maybe if you're using student workers and they're much more comfortable in, in Excel than they are archive space, you could have them fill out information like that. Again, really useful, not gonna cover it here because it's just too much. Um, transfer, again, sort of, if you wanna transfer this, uh, you know, to a different repository. Uh, well, not going to get into too much. Rapid data entry. Uh, I'm not going to get into rapid data entry. Um, you can check out the resources workshop uh, if you want to know more about that. Essentially, what it is is it's it's kind of like load via spreadsheet, but within the archival, uh, but within archive space itself. Um, instead, you kind of go you add row by row, and it's supposed to make uh, creating archival objects a bit easier because um, in the same way that the load via spreadsheet has columns of data, right, that you then can fill out. Um, and it, rapid data entry has that same thing, and you can have those columns be sticky, and you can fill out that information. Um, again, I'm not going to go into it, but it does make, uh, it does make creating archival objects, creating, uh, creating archival objects at the same level uh, a bit faster, um, but it is a little bit clunky at times. So uh, do make 
do make sure to check out the help center, check out the resources workshop if you have that, if you have uh, access to it, um, to go into that in more depth to see if that's something that you would use. Um, and as far as multi-level resources go, um, I think that's that's it for for the multi-level resources. I'm going to take a, a bit of a pause, and yeah, um, are are we still good on time, Jessica? I think we're good on time, but you know, digital objects is always a variable. Um, if you want to take a beat and maybe take a sip of water, Corey, um, if anyone has any questions about creating resource records or uh, resource component records, um, please feel free to drop those questions into the Q&A and we can uh, try to answer those now while Corey takes a little break. Um, otherwise, we can move right into digital objects, but I, um, I want to give a minute just to see if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask. Um, like Corey said, uh, rapid data entry, it, it'll, it, it makes it quicker to input information directly into the archive space application. Um, it is something, it's a tool that people either find very intuitive and enjoy using, or if you prefer to work in spreadsheets, load via spreadsheet, it might be a better option for you. Um, rapid data entry allows you to input data at the same level. So if you were uh, working and putting in, uh, you know, many, many correspondences at the item level next to the letter of Mr. Freeman. Uh, that's a, it's a nice way to do that much more quickly than having to create an archival object and then hitting save plus one, create the archival object, hit save plus one. You can just do it in uh, more of a spreadsheet sort of format. Uh, a couple caveats about rapid data entry. Um, make sure you are um, saving as you go. Set a number of uh, rows in your mind that when I hit that number of rows, I'm going to save. And I would say, you know, make it be 15 to 20, not 100, um, and because if something were to happen, none of those rows would be saved until you had saved them. And uh, also keep in mind, again, archive space, if you hit your lunch break time and you walk off and you come back and you haven't saved rapid data entry and it's timed out, you'll have lost all that work. So just uh, save early and save often when working with uh, rapid data entry. I think that's the best um, tip that I can give for that. Uh, but there are plenty of resources online about that. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions popping up in the Q&A, so we'll, we'll move away from creating resource records, but again, feel free to type questions in at any time, um, and if we don't answer them out loud, I can definitely type an answer into the chat. So, Corey, you feeling ready to move on to digital objects? Let's go. Absolutely. Let's do it. All right. Okay. All right, so uh, now that we've covered sort of the heart and soul of archive space, resource records, um, now I'd like to talk about digital objects. And so digital objects we're really talking about is describing uh, and links to digital materials. Um, archive space critically is not a digital, uh, uh, it is not a, a digital uh, archive asset management. management asset manager thank you i was not <laughs> getting the a there i was like what is that word digital asset manager it is not a digital asset manager it is not a file server you cannot upload pdfs tiffs actual things uh um, actual like you know text files or, or digital objects into archive space but what you can do and this is really critical is you can describe the metadata about those digital materials in archive space and then if you have a link to a DAM or a file server, right, you have a link to that thing, you can add that link into archive space and make that available so that people, when they go to the your archive space PUI, or, you know, again, if you're using exported EAD XML files, um, it'll it'll export digital, simple digital objects, and you'll be able to display that information to your researchers so that instead of coming to the actual archive, they can view it online, save themselves, and uh, a whole bunch of time and money probably. Um, so yeah, digital objects, describing and linking to digital materials. Um, describing is the key word there. We're talking about the metadata. We're not talking about the files themselves. Um, there are two kinds of digital objects in archive space. There is a simple object and there is a complex object. So a simple object really just means it's an intellect, it's the intellectual content combined into one file. And if that doesn't make much sense, um, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> 
it's basically just like one thing we're talking about um we're talking about like a, let's say you took a a scrapbook and you digitized the scrapbook and when you digitized it you saved it all as one pdf and you're like this makes sense it's it's one thing it's one pdf um one bit of metadata that I want to make, right? That's that's a case where you would use a simple simple digital object is that one thing. Complex digital object is a case where, let's say you took that same scrapbook and you're like, actually, um, this scrapbook has chapters in it. And I digitized each page individually. So each page has its own, you know, uh, digital image that links out to its own page and it's in a hierarchy. That's the case where you might say, I want to use a complex digital object because just like in resources, you can create a hierarchy with complex digital objects. So, right, you could say you could have your high level top, le your, your top level digital object information, right? This is the scrapbook. And then um, you can add children or add siblings, right? Add children. And then to those children, you could add siblings or more children describing the chapters and the individual pages, creating that hierarchy uh, for digital objects. So um, that's really kind of the key difference is um, between simple object, one thing, one metadata description of this one thing versus complex object where complex digital object where you're sort of building out that hierarchy. Um, and uh, for complex digital objects, I'm going to note two things. One, complex digital objects are not supported by in, uh, encoded archival description. Only simple digital objects will work if you are exporting EAD XML files. However, if you are using uh, METS or MODS, either of those standards, the METS or MOD standards, you can export complex digital objects uh, using those standards, um, and, and you can export it out of archive space. So, um, really, it just comes down to how you want to use and represent digital objects in archive space. Are, you're, are you going to make the decision that everything's going to be a simple digital object because one PDF, one TIFF file, whatever? Or do you want to allow for more granularity? Um, for instance, in the case of born digital materials, right? Um, if you want to allow sort of that, uh, that hierarchy to show um, in that digital object. So really, it's up to you how you want to use digital objects in that way. Enough talk. Well, actually, more talk. <laughs> but let's actually get to demoing what digital objects look like. So um, you know, there are two ways to create a, a, a digital object. One is to go up to the top right, oh, I'm sorry, top left, and uh, under the create digital object, this will create um, a digital object from scratch. Um, or if you are highlighted, I'm going to click on letter to Mr. Friedman here. Um, give it a sec. Or if you have an existing archival object, right? I've built out my resource, I've built out all of my archival objects, my children, I've created that hierarchy. And let's say I've digitized this letter and I wanna add that digital object to this particular thing. Um, in the, if I scroll down to instances, I can click add a digital object. And then this is the case where I can either search for an existing digital object if I've already made it, or I can create one. Um, and then this kind of gives a sub menu, uh, it gives all the same information that you would see. I'm not actually going to fill this out because it looks kind of weird. So I'm actually going to go up, confirm removal, scroll back up all the way. And I'm actually going to use the create digital object because it's, it's more straightforward. I'm going to leave the page. Yes. Don't save my changes. Um, so when you're greeted with creating a digital object, there are a few required fields, as there is um, with, with many things in archive space. The first required field is a title. So we are going to give our simple digital object the title of armor plate stockings. And if you think that's weird, <laughs> it's a weird name, I'll, I'll get to it. Um, next, I need an identifier. And again, this identifier absolutely needs to be unique. Oh, let's do that big again. Um, and so, I am going to give it the identifier. This copy over. Um, you can tell I've been practicing. I'm going to click publish because I want this digital object to be uh, visible uh, in our archive space public user interface in our PUI. Um, a few interesting notes about the basic information field for digital objects. You notice that there is a VRA core level. If you 
follow VRA core standards, you can fill that out. Um, digital object type, again, it's optional, but could be fairly useful. It's got some useful stuff in here, like a text, still image, sound recording, um, moving image. Um, for us, I'm just going to say it's a still image. Are there any restrictions associated with this? Um, yes or no. Next up, we have file versions. Um, file versions are very important because this is the place where you add the link to the to the digital object. This is the case where um, the only required field is the file URI, and this is where we input our URL to the thing that we want people to go look at um, because we spend a lot of time digitizing and, and, and do a lot of stuff. So I'm going to copy and paste a URL um, in there. Uh, and again, I want to make sure to click publish. I have been burned by this before, ask me, uh, where we did not publish our digital objects, any of them. So I had to go in and I actually had to work with the API to make a script to publish all of our digital objects because we didn't do that. And we were like, where, where are all our digital objects? They're, they're gone. Well, they were there. It's just, they weren't published. So make sure to click publish. And that will make sure that this file, your, th this URL that you input is visible via the PUI or in the exports that you use. Um, a few useful, so there's a few more fields. Again, all of these fields are optional. If you want a more in-depth view uh, or an in-depth discussion about what each, each of these fields do, Archive Space Help Center is very useful. Um, the Archive Space Trainer Corps did an excellent digital objects workshop. I believe it was a year or two ago. Um, and, and that gets more into these fields. Um, some of them can be very useful, especially for born digital uh, materials like checksums, checksum uh, methods. Um, these two X-Link things, they're talking about um, how the URL is sort of uh, either displayed um, or how it's uh, loaded um, with regards to EAD. So again, if you're not using EAD, don't don't worry about that stuff. Um, but yeah. So like uh, like we have with resources and accession records, a lot of this information as we scroll down is the same. It's it's literally the same. We can add a language. We can add dates. We can add extents. Um, classification agents, subjects, notes. Um, notes can be pretty useful, especially for digital objects. If you want to, you know, uh, if you want to add some additional context, um, rise statements, metadata, rise declarations. I'm not going to get into any of those things because we're we're, uh, this is, we're trying to be as speedy as possible. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and click save. Ah, notice I, I did it again. The identifier is not is not unique. So I'm going to be unique and add a dash four because I've practiced this a few times. So and get a load. There we go. Cool. Now we have our simple digital object. Um, uh, I want to take a brief break here. Jessica, am I? Uh, Am I going to be need to be done in four minutes or in fourteen minutes? Uh, you need to be done in fourteen minutes. Fourteen. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna do the wrap up at forty five. At forty five. Okay. You got cool. time. All right. So, um, yeah. So now we've created a simple digital object, and um, with this, we have uh, most of the same options that we had available to us in resources, right? In the top left-hand corner, enable reorder mode, enable reorder mode, add child, rapid data entry. Again, if we wanted to build out this to a multi-level, um, or I'm sorry, a complex digital object, not multi-level, complex digital object, we would do that. I'll show that off in a bit. Um, over in the left, uh, I'm sorry, right-hand corner, I am getting all confused here. In the right-hand corner, we have a bunch of different options. Publish all, view published, again, very important. Um, exporting, right, this is where we can download mods, METs, or DC, Dublin Core, um, if we wanted to uh, export that information. Um, one thing that I am going to point out is this button here, view published. Um, so if I click this button, and I'm going to do that. This will take us to the Archive Space PUI. So this takes us to the Archive Space PUI and, and uh, for this particular digital object. 
um, you'll notice that it's not actually associated with any resource. It's not associated with any archival object. That's because whenever we uh, use the create digital object method, um, it's not going, it's just going to be a standalone digital object, right? It's not associated with any resource. We have to do that from uh, the archival object uh, menu screen um, in order to associate it with that in, the, in that uh, instances, instances section. So um, one thing to note, there's this big bright button, red button that says digital object still image. Um, this is the case where I can click on it. And if I do that, it will take me to the link that I input um, in that file URI section. Um, and I use this particular example because I actually digitized uh, this, uh, this, uh, this plate. I'm very proud of it. Um, it's very cool. Um, so yeah, that's how you would, uh, that's how your researchers would uh, be able to tell whether or not uh, there was a digital object they could view online. This can be actually changed uh, into a thumbnail. Um, that it does not come from Archive Space by default. You would have to install a plugin in order to enable that. But um, I have seen quite a few institutions enable that plugin so that instead of just this bog standard, you know, image, uh, you know, digital object still image, it would be a thumbnail so people would actually get a sense of what they were looking at um, before clicking on it. Corey? Yes. I'm going to interrupt you there. Um, it is possible to have an embedded image there uh, without a plugin. Um, you can do that through the Xlink uh, attributes. If you um, select um, on load and embed. So if the show, uh, yeah, if you want to scroll down. So if your actuate attribute is set to on load and your Xlink at show attribute is embed, it will actually embed uh, the image. It is not a thumbnail. Whatever size your image is, is what size it will be. So if it is a very large image, you know, think about it. Um, it's probably going to take a minute for it to index. Um, no but it will it will show an embedded image there. Um, that's one way to to get around um, archive space not being a digital asset management system and having things loaded into the application. But it's just showing a, a basically a preview, and then you would still click to wherever the actual image lived. Um, and I'll I'll also say very briefly um, that the next version of archive space version three point four there's not a release date for that, but it is. Um, in testing, so there will be a release very soon. Uh, this functionality is significantly expanded uh, with representative images um, being included uh, as part of not just digital objects, but uh, include but with resource records as well that you would like to have some representative images uh, displayed with your resource records. So this functionality is actually going to get much cooler very soon, but it is possible to have an embedded image um, within a published uh, digital object right now, but only by using that little trick of the onload embed. Awesome. Thank you so much for correcting me there, Jessica. Um, and yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, that's kind of how you create a simple digital object. Um, and I think that's all I, I had. Yes. So um, now that we've created, now that we've sort of created a simple digital object, let's quickly create a complex digital object. So, like we were talking about before, if I had a scrapbook or I had a, a book, right? Probably better to describe a book. If I had a, if I had a book and I uh, digitized a bunch of the pages of this book, but I want to describe a hierarchy, right? This book has chapters, and and each chapter has a page, and I've digitized digitized each individual page, um, I might want to consider creating a complex digital object so that I could represent that hierarchy within archive space. Um, uh, and so in order to do that, uh, we've created this simple digital object. Um, I can start creating this multi-level, uh, this, this complex digital, I keep confusing it, uh, this complex digital object by create, by selecting add child and it will open up a digital object component. So again, some of the wording is is a little bit different, you know, from from place to place in archive space. And this is one of those cases where it is a little different. So instead of calling it like a digital object object, it's a digital object component. It's a component of a of a digital object, but it essentially works in the same way that multi level resource records do. So in the basic information, um, we have a few conditional. Uh, conditionally required 
fields. Uh, label is one of them. Uh, title is also one of them. So if I wanted to say um, Bob Ross recording, I could say I could give it a title right there. Um, and again, I either have to make sure that it uh, it either has a title or it has a date. I need at least one of those things. So um, for me, I'm actually going to create both of them. Uh, I'm going to say it's a single, and I'm going to say uh, 1982 um, for for this Bob Ross recording. Um, and then here is where I could add a file version. Um, again, I could uh, specify here. Let me go ahead and pick out my other URL. I think it's different. Yeah, it's different. Right here. Okay, and copy and paste it, right? Making sure to click publish. And yeah, I think I'm going to go ahead and try and save this. Let's see. There we go. It's saved. So now, uh, now I have a complex digital object, right? It's got a little bit of a hierarchy, right? Armor plate stockings is the parent of Bob Ross recording 1982. Um, the label, you know, if you want to, the label the, is sort of the position of the component. So um, uh, I seem to think of it as like if you had um, a vinyl record and there's a side A and there's a side B, uh, or, you know, uh, that I could say in this label, um, you know, this is side A, and then I could create another digital object component, and I would say the label is side B. Um, that's generally what, uh, yeah, generally what that's referring to. Um, I could also, again, fill out an identifier um, if I wanted to create a unique identifier for this particular digital object component. Um, but again, that's not necessary. Um, oh, I also forgot to click publish. So we want to make sure to click publish so that this uh, information is, is available. Um, and if I did forget, again, I could go up to the armor plate stockings and I could click publish all and that would make that would publish not just all the information in that armor plate stockings uh, digital object, but everything underneath it. So the Bob Ross recording, and let's say I had a whole bunch of other stuff beneath it, it would publish all of that stuff beneath it. So it would save me a whole bunch of time. Um, again, I can keep adding uh, children an unlimited number of times um, and uh, archive space would, should be able to, uh, you know, it should work with archive space. Um, and if I go to, I'm going to see if I go to view published. Yep. You notice that uh, a couple things have changed, right? We have our file URI, which is, is displaying here. Um, so if I click that, you know, it would take me to file URI that I imported for this digital app component. And over on the very right hand side, I have this uh, very simple hierarchy going on um, that, you know, says, hey, what is the, uh, you know, what is the relationships to all this stuff? Um, okay. And just like in uh, multi-level resource records in the top left-hand corner, we have enable reorder mode. Again, very handy if you want to, uh, you know, move a bunch of stuff, um, you know, move a bunch of stuff around um, to make to make more sense of the collection. Add child. So if I wanted to add a child to the Bob Ross recording, right? This is uh, Bob Ross recording, 1982, and then I wanted to create a child that says um, this was a certain part of that recording, All right? And I, I could add child, or I could add a sibling that says Bob Ross recording, 1983 and 1984, and I can keep adding uh, siblings that are at the same level. And again, I could also use rapid data entry to make adding adding those uh, siblings. Uh, rel relatively easier um, because I would have a bunch of sticky columns that I could, uh, instead of filling out each individual digital object component every time, I could have some information that sticks with it and then I could save it. And um, like Jessica was mentioning, um, 15 to 20 at a time is is advisable um, anymore. And, you know, it, it's, it's up to your own risk, right? Uh, pr proceed at your own risk. Um, but yeah, really, when it comes to complex digital objects, that's kind of the that's kind of the whole picture. It's very similar to multi-level resource records, right? It's really just down to how do you want to describe 
multi-level resource records. Um, uh, I'm sorry, multi-level uh, digital objects, right? Do you want to do you want to uh, display, do you want them to be organized uh, as complex digital objects with a hierarchy, or do you want to keep them plain and simple, you know, one thing or, you know, one link or, or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's about it that I have for, for complex and, and simple digital objects. Awesome. Thanks, Corey. If you want to go ahead and take a drink of water, that was yes. a whirlwind. Um, a couple a couple caveats. Corey did cover this, but I want to make sure to point it out. If you um, create a digital object from within uh, an archival object or a resource record uh, using that those instances like Corey showed, when you create that digital object from within uh, another uh, record, you are going to be creating a simple digital object. You're going to be creating just a top level simple digital object. If you do what Corey just did and create a digital object record as a standalone and then you want to go back to a resource record and link uh, an, a, a digital object instance there, the only um, digital object records available to you for linking are the top level uh, digital object records. You cannot link digital archival object records to other records. So just keep that in mind. It's an internal practice decision. Uh, I know that many organizations have hundreds of thousands of simple digital object or of simple digital objects because they use uh, instances in that way and they link their digital material. Um, so that Corey's doing that right now. He's adding a digital object. So um, he's able to browse and link so he can link directly that or armor plate stockings but you notice that the bob ross uh, example is not available there you cannot link uh, digital object component records um it's also uh like corey mentioned as well um just consider uh export format or formats and what you might want to export out of archive space if you're looking to export out mets mods or dublin core some sort of digital metadata standard building complex digital objects might be the right decision for you if you're more interested in exporting EAD and linking those digital materials back to physical materials, uh, you know, if you're if you have a lot of digital reproductions and that sort of thing, um, then maybe simple digital objects is the better choice for you. Um, another thing to consider when you're creating digital objects, if you have a digital object that has multiple file versions, which is super common, you have a JPEG, you have a TIFF, uh, you have, you know, your service copy, that sort of thing, you can add multiple file versions to one single record. You don't have to create a TIFF uh, record, you don't have to, you can, in a JPEG, you can just add, keep adding file versions like Corey's showing. And if, you're, if your TIFFs are internal only, then don't hit publish. Um, maybe one of your file versions actually is not a, a URI, it's just you saying, check Jessica's uh, computer <laughs> that it's stored there, um, and you probably don't want to publish that, then, then you can do that as well. But you can include as many file versions as you need and, and only publish those that you'd like. So um, yeah, there's a lot to consider with digital objects, and there, there are plenty of resources online to explore that. Uh, we do already have one question in the Q&A, and if anyone else has any questions, please do put them in. Um, does Archive Space have a read-only option for external viewers, and does it limit that session's minutes for them? So if, uh, if a researcher is accessing Archive Space from the public user interface, that that really is read only. The public user interface users there do not have any ability to edit records, um, access your records in any way other than just viewing them. And they also don't have access to certain records like locations. So even if they see that you have a collection and they see that it's housed at a certain library or in a certain repository and they can request access to it, they're not being told the particular shelf or location or vault that it might be in. Um, so they, they, a user accessing from the public side is not going to be able to take any action on your records. So uh, I know a lot of organizations actually their public are other in, other coworkers who do not work in the archives. You don't necessarily need um, someone in a different department who it doesn't work with archives regularly to be on the staff side, uh, potentially causing some damage to your metadata. And then the question of does it limit that session's minutes for them? Keep in mind that archive space is uh, is not a digital asset management system. So if you're asking if um, 
a researcher accessing a recording or some digital files, if there's a limit to how long they can view them, that would that would be dependent on the digital asset management system that you're using. Archive Space uh, can serve as a pointer to wherever that material is stored, uh, but it does not store the material itself, and it doesn't. Um, other than providing a link to that material, it doesn't have anything to do with access or how long people access or that sort of thing. Um, the archive space, the application, and the, on the public user side, what your what your users are seeing there is is metadata about your collections, the descriptions of your collections. They're not able to actually um, access digital copies of your materials or anything like that from within the application itself. If that doesn't answer it. Um, please follow up. Yeah, the only thing I'll, I'll mention too, Jessica, if, if it's okay to step in, um, if you can set, uh, you can create users that only have a, a read-only access. So, you know, if, if I wanted to um, give someone access to, to see the staff interface of archive space, um, but I didn't want them messing around with any of the metadata, I could set that uh, that setting, um, if I'm an administrator, I could I'd set that for that particular user. So that might be another uh, option if you're like, I want them to look at this staff user interface, just don't touch anything. Uh, that could be an option. Yeah, great point, Corey. Um, maybe you have like an administrator or maybe your director, someone that that maybe would want access to the staff user interface, but you don't necessarily want messing with your data, you can definitely um, set their permissions so that they're read only. You, the permissions are, are very granular for users. So you actually could set um, to, you could set so that a user has the ability to create a resource record, but not they cannot delete a resource record or they can edit a resource record, but they can't, um, you know, they, they're not able to, take particular larger actions across a repository. They can't merge records, that sort of thing. So you can get pretty granular on the staff side about, about what sort of access people have. Any, any other questions? We have about 10 more minutes, but I won't make anyone stay up uh, any later or <laughs> keep anyone um, any longer than we have to. So I, uh, I'll give it a few more minutes. And if we don't have any questions in the chat, we'll we'll go ahead and, and wrap up. Um, if you are writing a question and it's longer than you anticipated, feel free to lower your or raise your hand. And I'll know that that means that you want to you want to give it a moment and wait. We can definitely do that. Not seeing any hands. Uh, Corey, anything you'd like to add before we wrap up? No, I mean, Ar Archive Space is a fantastic tool. I mean, I, I'm really, I, I know it's weird to hype this up at, at sort of the end session, but I'm really glad to have learned it and, and you know, dug into it. It's, it's a really well-built application. What a great way to end, Corey. Uh, since we don't have any anything coming in the the chat, we'll we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. Um, thank you to everyone for attending. If you have any questions about Archive Space or Archive Space membership after this training, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, our email address is archivespacehome at lyricist.org. That is also included in um, the emails and the agenda and everything that went out. Um, at, so please. Don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions uh, and make use of those uh, those resources that are linked at the bottom of the agenda. There's some really handy things there, including a workshop evaluation. Um, I, as you as you know, uh, this is uh, not a time we typically offer trainings because all of our trainers are located in the United States, but we are interested in offering more training uh, for users outside of the continental U.S. So having feedback about about this training would be really helpful. And if there are any topics that you would like to see covered uh, in the future, please please do fill out that evaluation. It's really helpful to have that feedback. Uh, we'd love to do more trainings like this in the future. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you to Corey for staying up late with me and, and working on this. And um, I look forward to seeing all of you at the next Archive Space event. Thanks everybody.